Good morning, Reptile Entrepreneurs. Today, I have an interview with Frank Payne of Living Art by Frank Payne. Living Art by Frank Payne is Frank's business where he breeds exotic lizards. Now, the reason why I really wanted to have Frank on is because he's doing things differently. Usually, if you think about becoming a breeder, you're going to pick a lizard that has an established market, and then you're just going to breed a lot of that lizard. Well, Frank is going the path less traveled. He has a number of different species of lizards that he breeds. Now, I know that is our dream. When we say we want to be a lizard breeder, we are uh, envisioning 15 different species because we love 15 different species. But business-wise, that's a challenging way to go because that's 15 different markets. It's much easier to have one market and specialize in it. But Frank has gone a different direction, and he is showing us how he can make it work where he has a number of different species of lizards. Not only that, but he is actually creating new markets for these species, each species at a time. And so this is going to be a highly educational episode for anyone thinking about becoming a lizard breeder. Please join me in welcoming Frank Payne to the Reptile Entrepreneur Podcast. Hello, Reptile Entrepreneurs. This is Bill Strand, and today I'm here with Frank Payne of Living Art by Frank Payne. Hello, Frank. Hi, Bill. Great to be here. All right. To I want to uh, give a everybody a background as to uh, what you do in the community and give us a, a an overview of what Living Art by Frank Payne is. Um, well, my business started out as, you know, as a hobby, but then over the years, um, it just morphed into something more than that. Um, and I can, you know, get into the details of how that happened, how I went from being a hobbyist to, to uh, a business owner um, when it comes to breeding. But I've always, you know, my reptile story could take, you know, an hour or two, I'm sure. But, you know, I've always been interested in reptiles since since I've had a memory since I was a young child, always had reptiles. I was actually a uh, herpetology zookeeper for several years during college and, and immediately following after college uh, before becoming a science teacher. But it, it's just reptile keeping and breeding has always been a part of my life. And over the past you know handful of years, it's morphed into uh, a pretty successful family business. Okay. So when you decided that you wanted to breed seriously, what was your vision for that? What were you hoping to get out of that that you didn't have as a breeder? Yeah, well, the at first, it, you know, I, I never, I never started out with the intention of starting a business. That was not my intention. It's just I've always loved reptiles. I've always loved keeping them. I've always enjoyed breeding them. You know, seeing the whole life cycle. Um, so that's just always been just a passion for me. And, and if I didn't make any money, I would still be breeding reptiles, although not on this scale, of course. Um, but there was, you know, an instance I can, I, you know, distinctly remember the moment and what species caused this where the, the, the switch flicked in my brain saying, okay, this could be something else. You know, I started, um, I've been passionate about Lygodactylus, William Psi, electric blue day geckos, mm -hmm. endangered species from Tanzania. I've been passionate about them for a long time. I kind of started off with a couple pairs of them, started breeding them. And at the time, they were very, very rare in the hobby and started selling my offspring that I produced um, quite easily. And they were fairly productive. And I started to build relationships in the herpetocultural community, even more so than I had in the past. And, I, and it just... I remember after like a couple months of this, of producing a decent number of the, of this gecko species and selling them quite easily, like, like, Oh, like this might actually be something here. There might be something here that I had not considered. Cause at first it was just like, you know, I just want to sell the offspring so that I can recoup some of the expense so that I can then just sink all that money back into reptiles, buy more reptiles with that, with that money. Um, and that's how it started. But after a while of that, of it kind of growing naturally, with not intentionally at first, that then, you know, I had to change my mind, like, okay, this could be a business and let's start to, to think about it from that point of view. Now, when you make that change from an, I guess we'll call it amateur hobbyist or a hobbyist who breeds without the intention of making it a business, and then you switch to being a serious professional breeder where you're 
you have business uh, intentions. What has to change mm -hmm. for that? Well, um, you have to be careful about what projects that you take on. You have to be careful about where your money goes. You have, because of limited time and space and resources, you have to be careful about working with projects, working with species that do not make you money. Because if they, you know, if they are not making you money, if they're in fact losing money, well, then that's kind of like counter to, you know, a business point of view, right? So there's, um, I have a handful of animals now that I keep strictly for pleasure that there will be no chance of them making me money of being like a good business investment. Um, but that's for me to kind of keep my passion going and to keep me, you know, excited about it and, you know, doing the day to day, but that can't be the only consideration you have, you know, if you want to have a business, then you have to make the majority of your decisions, um, from that point of view, from a, from a business standpoint, what's profitable and what's not. And when we're doing it, uh, as a hobby, we do make the decisions based on what our pleasure is. And now you're talking about business aspects. What kind of business aspects uh, is that, uh, are those, and how does that compromise the pleasure? Right. So, for instance, if there's a species, I, you know, that is maybe very rare um, that maybe has a very low reproductive rate or that maybe not many other people would be interested in. Those are the type of species that are just never going to pay for themselves, right? You have, you know, the, the if you're going to do things correctly and ethically and take care of the animals well, it's going to require a large amount of, of capital going into them, feeding them, lighting them, housing them, cleaning them, all that, st and not to mention your time, right? That's a very big factor, um, you know, that I started to think about is like, where am I spending my time? Because now my time has a value too, because there's only so much of it. And, you know, where is my time going? You know, cause that's, you know, is it helping the business? Um, so looking at, animal i i simply i can't have a room full which i have you know an entire basement here of animals i could not fill this up with animals that don't make money otherwise it wouldn't be a business um and there's nothing wrong with that if that's what somebody wants to do but it's never going to be a business then um i've always looked at it from since since i made the transition from business i when i decide to keep an animal i'd say 90 percent of the animals that i keep they have to meet two criteria Right. Um, I have to enjoy them. I have to think that they're awesome in some way. Um, so it's more than two. So I'm going to read off it. Maybe it'll be, it might be more than two, actually. I have to enjoy them. Um, there has to be a market for them. There have people have to want them as, you know, like, and sometimes that takes some figuring and sometimes that takes some trial and error to figure out, is there a market for this? Do people want this animal um, more than just like a handful of people anyway? Um, and then for me, the third consideration has to be is the space that it takes up. I do um, square foot, you know, cost analysis, like how much money per square foot is a particular project bringing in versus a different project. And I have to just balance all of that, um, taking all those things into consideration, right? Because if I were to work with, say, very large reptiles, um, even if they sold for a good amount of money, because they would take up so much more space, their babies would take up so much more space than say electric blue geckos. The, I only have 400 square feet to work with, not counting my outdoor enclosures. So like I only have 400 square feet. So that to fill that up. So, you know, if an animal takes, you know, two square feet versus 20 square feet, you know, that's a big uh, factor in there, but to keep my passion going and to keep it, you know, something that I still love and care about on a day-to-day -day basis and not just a job. Um, I, it does have to meet that criteria of, do I think they're cool? Like, do I enjoy keeping them? Is it an animal that I would keep even if money wasn't a factor? If it doesn't meet that criteria, then I'm not keeping it because there are definitely species that I could be working with and make more money than I'm doing right now. 
but I don't want to because I just don't want to work with that particular species for my own personal reasons. So how often have you come into a situation where you're not, you, you say, I should make this business decision, but it comes at the expense of how much you're enjoying it. How often do you run into that? Um, not too often. Um, I've definitely cut a few projects loose that I've enjoyed. Um, but the thing is though, there's, for me, it's really not too much of a big issue. It hasn't been so far anyway, because I just love all reptiles yeah. <laughs> more or less like so much, like they're, they're all awesome in some way. So it's like, I have no shortage of things to keep me going, to keep me passionate about. So it's not like I'm going to run out of stuff that I want to work with, you know, that I have to like, oh gosh, now I can't keep this amazing species because of a business consideration, you know, because I, because it's not making enough money for the business, but because there's always other stuff out there that I'm, that I am interested in and that are exciting and, and, you know, it's, it's a very diverse group of animals. And so I, I, I don't see that becoming a problem. It hasn't yet anyway. All right. Could you run us through a thought process, say an analysis that you did go through recently for a species? Uh, how would that look? All right. Um, so I was working, I wanted to try to work with a uh, banana pectinata mm -hmm. spiny tail iguanas. So they are one of the smaller species of iguanas that you can keep. They're, you know, like a male is like 20 inches, 24 inches without the tail. Mm -hmm. um, and female is significantly smaller. Female is not like a lot bigger than a big bearded dragon. So they're not like a huge animal. Uh, but the males are about twice that size. So they're, they're really cool, bright yellow. Um, people like them a lot. They can be very personable. Um, and I raised a group of them from babies to adult size and it just got to, and I enjoyed them. They were cool. I liked them a lot, but then I just kept seeing this large, you know, and if I'm lucky, I'm going to get, you know, I could keep two, you know, I, I had like a group of them and I ended up only being able to keep two animals because the two, I had a male and two females and the one females started to fight. So I had to separate them. Um, so I had one pair of animals, one female, one, you know, animal with reproductive potential in a giant enclosure, you know, an enclosure mm -hmm. that, and, and honestly, like, is it for me, it's a giant enclosure in my tiny little basement here. You know, it's like six foot by six foot by three foot. Um, but honestly, for those animals, it really wasn't that big, especially the male. So it was kind of like a, so anyway, every time I walked in the room, I just, I saw that. And I thought about, yeah, that's a cool animal, but honestly, I'd like to keep them in something bigger. And there's one animal there, whereas I could turn that into a blue beauty and null setup where I could keep easily half a dozen animals in there that have a higher reproductive potential that, you know, probably will make more money. So it's like, it just like, I thought about it and I just, you know, I just like, I have to make that cut. So those, um, those group of animals, they went to somebody that was working with that species. They found, I found them a great home, but I moved on from that project. They were awesome. I enjoyed my time with them. I'm probably never, I'm never going to keep them again just because they just don't fit in with what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, tell us about what you're doing with carpet chameleons. And the context of this question is uh, when you're a breeder and you're doing this seriously, you have choices between uh, these diverse projects of the uh, these special anoles, special geckos, special iguanas, or sticking with one species and focusing on that species, mm -hmm. multi-generational and having different bloodlines. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess before we get into a uh, species yeah, level, could you comp uh, compare and contrast those two approaches to being a breeder? Yeah. So what I have done and what I've found to be successful for me is kind of throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. So what I'm always looking for my, in terms of expanding the business, in terms of, you know, having gains, you know, more gains every year, I throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. I'm always looking for my next cornerstone species, all right? A species that, like you said, that I'm going to stick with and that I'm going to work with multi-generationally and that, you know, my goal is to be the guy for a handful of species. 
you know, and that's what I've been doing. And that's the way that I approach it. Um, carpet chameleons, electric blue geckos, spear point leaf tail geckos, jeweled lacertas, blue tongue skinks, and a handful of others. These are species that I've all worked with now, multiple generations now, and that they fit, you know, they meet all of my criteria. Um, and those I'm going to stick with. And, you know, there's always the possibility that things will change in the future, but of those species I mentioned, and plus a couple more that I'm, you know, that I'm just ramping up right now, I plan to work with indefinitely. Cause I do think that's important to, you know, to, you have to be, you know, have to be known for something right there. I do think that there is a difference between me and say a pet store that just sells a bunch of different organisms. Like there's no, there's no animal here that I sell unless it's like a special circumstance that I didn't produce. Right. I'm not getting animals in from other breeders and then reselling them. I don't have, um, Mm -hmm. you know, a a website where it's just, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want to use the negative word, but flipping where it's just buying organisms from somewhere else and then, and then reselling them. That's not what I'm doing, but at the same time, I'm still trying to offer diversity because, you know, there's only so many people in the market for a carpet chameleon, right? I could devote this entire room to carpet chameleons or this entire room to electric blue geckos, but that would be a problem because I would quickly flood the market with those species, right? If I, if I chose to, I could like, I produce 200 electric blue geckos a year. At my peak with carpet chameleons, it's 200 a year. You know, the past couple of years, it's only been about 100. But still, if I wanted to produce a 1,000 electric blue geckos or a 1,000 carpet chameleons, I could. But I don't think, you know, I try to be careful not to flood the market with a particular species because, like, I'm not working with low-end um, kind of beginner entry species, you know, like the bearded dragon, leopard gecko, or what have you, that has a huge potential base that's not that's never been my target um market it's i've always tried to target um the kind of intermediate to advanced keeper um somebody that has the has a couple years of experience and is will is wanting to try something newer a little bit more exotic maybe something that's not in all the pet stores but still makes a good pet or, or at the very least a good display organism something that's hardy you know, I'm kind of rambling a little bit right now, but like one of the things that I've shied away from that one of the th- way, uh, excuse me, one of the things that I've learned over the years is like, I don't work with ultra delicate animals anymore. I used to like, you know, like for my own personal, and I'm sure I will, you know, here and there, but like, I try not to focus on very delicate or very rare organisms that your average intermediate keeper could not keep alive because otherwise what's the, what's the point? You know, I'm, I'm, I've gone through the ego stage of my life of the, of my twenties where I just want to prove that I can do this, that I can do that, that I can own sun gazers or I can own fly river turtles or earless monitors. Like I've gone through that ego crap and it's just behind me. Cause like, what's for me, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, sun gazers are awesome, but like, they're never going to be established in captivity. W- what is, you know, I mean, like most people could not keep them correctly so like what's the point why would i even be trying to breed them um or like you know for instance like some organisms like they make awful displays they're buried 24 you know 24 7 they're buried under the ground what's the point of producing that and putting numbers of that out into her pediculture you know if that's your passion and that's what you want to study that's fine but then like that's not really like part of like her pediculture as as a business and and disseminating those animals into a wider audience all right there's uh there's I mean, a species I mean, I straight that off you topic work there <laughs> hopefully i answered your question uh you answered the yes yes now, there's a species <laughs> i'd like to talk about this uh uh sophotis dumbara uh is that did yep. i say that right okay what I, I is that i believe it's cophotis but so Cofins. it is okay, it is awesome is what it is yeah you yeah close enough i mean and i could be wrong too i, I don't know i i took latin in high school but that was a distant memory um they are an amazing uh critically endangered agama from sri lanka 
Um, there are very, very few of them in the States. Um, a handful of blood, bloodlines out there. A friend of mine, Justin Munsterman, is one of the first people, if not the first person, to produce them in the U.S. Um, and I'm, you know, I've been purchasing his first round of babies that he's been uh, producing because I. So they are, and I've told people this, so it's not like I don't, I don't really keep secrets um, when it comes to my business, but like they. I plan for them to be a cornerstone species because they have it all. Like they are relatively small, quite small actually, uh, but they're very bold. They're very hardy. They're relatively easy to breed. They're life bearing. They have incredible squamation. Uh, their scales are just unbelievable. They look like tiny little dragons. Um, they can live in pairs you know, year round, they aren't aggressive. I wouldn't keep males together, but you know, like a pair is, is fine. And they just make wonderful little displays. And I, in, I think that they have a bright future in her pediculture. And, you know, also from a business point of view, very few people have them. Um, if things go well, then I'll be one of the few people, you know, producing them and putting them out in her pediculture. So that makes sense business wise as well. So what are the challenges in trying to establish this species? Because seeing on your website, that's the first time I've ever seen of this, uh, this uh, lizard. And mm -hmm. so, of course, that becomes a challenge is if nobody's seen it, it doesn't matter how great it is. Yeah. They have to be educated about it. So how does that play into your mm -hmm. decisions? So I... Honestly, I, I like that aspect and I actually strive, for, I actually, that's a part of what I'm looking for is I want to be the person that educates people about these new species that they may have never heard of. So I, I figure out, okay, is this going to be a good pet? Like, I don't want to like, I'm not trying to like push out there like these, these animals that are extremely delicate and hard to keep alive, right? First, I need to make sure that they're going to make good pets or displays for your average, you know relatively experienced hobbyist. Um, and then I want to be the person that educates people. I, so that when they search this species or when they see it for the first time, I want my name to be associated with it. Right. When, you know, a lot of people, when they, if you search up, like for instance, electric blue geckos or carpet chameleons, my articles and my YouTube videos are within the first two or three hits almost always. So and that's what I'm looking for. I'm trying to be the person that lets people know about these amazing, you know, relatively new species that they may might not have heard of before. Okay. Yeah. I, I watch your account to learn about new species. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. So. I hear that. Uh, I hear that a lot. I, that's the thing I can flatter myself the most is I have really good taste in lizards. <laughs> What challenges have you run into being the diversity lizard guy? And, and I'll give a little background for everybody who's wondering why I'm asking this question. If, if someone came to me sure. and said, hey, I want to get into breeding, I would recommend to them to stick with one species, uh, get very good at that, mm -hmm. and develop a market around that. Because it takes time to build up a market. And if like you're, you're in carpet chameleons and you've been doing that for years and you have built up that market. So if anybody needs a carpet chameleon uh, anywhere in the community, oh, go talk to Frank Payne, talk to Frank Payne. That's the first thing out of everybody's mouth, whether you're in earshot or not. And that comes from <laughs> dedicating years and years to establishing that market, establishing that reputation and now when you have all these different species, it's like you start over on each time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, yeah, there, how, there's what, definitely what, how would you recommend, what would you recommend give advice to somebody who <sighs> want, who is looking at this and saying, what should yeah. I do? Sure. So, I mean, I think that your advice is good advice. And I, I think that if, if some, I think that if somebody is asking the question, how do I get into breeding? then then your advice is 100 percent you know like the way to go i never ask that question of anybody right i my so like we've talked before on other podcasts and some people might know me but a lot of people probably don't so i'll just explain a little bit about my background like the reason why what i'm doing works 
is is more to do with I think my own personal history than it does with any special business thing that I'm doing, right? So I have just always been obsessed with reptiles. I've always been a science guy. And then, so I've had a diverse collection of animals, just like what a lot of people do, you know, like two, two of this, two of that, two of this, and, and doing that forever. And then I went into the zoo field, doing it professionally, working with an even more diverse collection of animals. And, you know, one of the things that sets, you know, me apart and you apart and some other people apart is, is that I never stopped. I never took a break. Yeah. I never took a hiatus. You know, like this is, there is literally the only time I didn't have a reptile in my possession is when I studied abroad in England for six months. And that's literally the, you know, the only time, even through college, I had animals in my dorm room. You know, I had, a, I had a great mom who took care of some of my animals at home, even when I was at college. So like, I've never stopped this. I'm never going to stop it. And I just, because of my zookeeping experience and because of um, the fact that I've just, I've been doing this since I could walk, um, it, that that's what's allowed me to do this. Like I have the basis, I have the fundamentals um, built up previous to starting my business. Right. And so that's what I, what I tell people all the time. Cause I, I ask occasionally too about like starting a business. It's just like, it's, I, I personally don't think when it comes to breeding reptiles or breeding animals, I don't think you should go into it with the mindset of starting a business. I don't think that's, that's just my personal opinion. Maybe that's wrong. I don't think that that's the way to start it because then I think that somewhere along the line, the animal's needs and the animal's well-being is always going to become secondary if you start with the business perspective first and then try to make money selling reptiles, which it is. It's a very, um, you know, like, um, gosh, I'm, I'm struggling for the word here, um, but it, it's uh, very tempting to do because like when it comes to like square foot and like producing animals and like how much they're worth. There's not much that can like top reptiles. Like it's very, very tempting to see, you know, especially if you look at some of those like ball pythons and stuff like that, it's really easy for an outsider to look and see these price tags. Like, well, I can just get two and make more, yeah. you know? And so like, I think that people come into it at that point of view and, that, and that's, and that's the point I try to tell people is I never came into it from that perspective. I never started that way. It went that way. Um, I'm very happy it went that way, um, but it wasn't my plan. I didn't plan to start a business. So I always recommend people, if you want to be a reptile breeder, first be a reptile keeper, do it for years, then be a reptile breeder. And like you said, you know, start with a particular species that you're passionate about, you know, and quite frankly, like the world doesn't need another leopard gecko breeder, <laughs> yes. breeder, or bearded dragon breeder, or, you know, like the or ball python breeder. We just don't need it. Like the, it, there's too many already. Like there's already more than there are homes for. Like if you can go to a reptile rescue and if you see a particular species in that rescue, don't breed it. Don't need to. Yeah, right. You know, we stick. are. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just an idea, but like it's what find something else. It's a diverse group of animals, you know, and then not that there's anything wrong with keeping those animals that not, not a thing in the world. But when it comes to breeding, especially as a business, like, I don't know, pick something else. There's plenty of stuff out there. The hobby would, the hobby and, you know, the, the, uh, the industry would benefit from uh, increased diversity. So that, you know, and plus, you know, that's, that's always been my thing too, is like set yourself apart, right? It is really easy to set yourself apart as an electric blue gecko breeder when there's hardly anyone else mm -hmm. doing it. Whereas like trying to set yourself apart as a ball Python breeder, like good luck. I can't imagine yeah. trying to, I wouldn't, I can't imagine trying to enter that market. I, I'll tell you what, like I used to breed Panther chameleons, Bill, like mm -hmm. I won't even breed Panthers anymore. Like I, I'm, I, that's just like, there's too many other people that are very well established that are super good at breeding Panther chameleons. They're the person, they're the guy for Panther chameleons, you know, and there's not just one, there's a handful, but like, there's no reason, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to, to compete overly. So now eventually I'm, you know, starting to see, I have to, you know, there's going to be competition with some of these, 
kind of other species that I'm working with. And, but that's fine because that's success on your part. And so my, yeah, that's what I'm hoping for. And if it ever gets to a point where there are so many electric blue gecko breeders or so many carpet chameleon breeders (laughs) that I'm having a hard time selling them. Well, I've done my job and now I'm going to move on. I'm going to do, I'm going to do something else or like, I'm I'll, I'll pull back from those species and then, you know, reallocate uh, resources elsewhere and, and find the next thing. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about your digital footprint, how you've set up. Uh, and this is for the entrepreneurs in the audience who are saying, okay, uh, we, we all get really good, excited about breeding. And we, uh, we uh, research the breeding and we get really good at uh, producing the animals. But where a lot of people just fall face flat is, well, what now? So- uh, what is your yeah. digital footprint out there? Why did you make those decisions and how do they work together? Sure. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll kind of start with like the whole evolution of the digital, my digital footprint over the years. You know, like it started on the forums, like chameleon forums. I was also very big into the, the dart frog forums because, you know, like honestly, before, you know, you and I knew each other before I was known as a chameleon guy, I was a dart frog guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was this and that. And so like just with those forums that some people might not even be familiar with <laughs> yeah. these days. Um, and, and then a lot of the, uh, the traffic migrated to, to Facebook. Um, and I followed that, you know, so, and then a lot of the, the traffic moved from Facebook to Instagram and YouTube. And I followed that a lot of it's moving to TikTok, and eventually maybe I'll follow <laughs> that. I don't want to, but maybe I will. Um, Right now, my main focus in terms of um, social media is Instagram, um, but I still I post uh, regularly to my Facebook page, and um, I started with my YouTube channel, and you know I felt like I developed a pretty quick audience, and I get I have a ton of views on some of my videos, and I get a lot of feedback, and you know um, f- for that, and my website too gets a fair amount of traffic. Uh, you know I have email subscribers through my website. Um, so I guess like tr- just, um, staying abreast and like staying, um, you know, tuned in to modern technology, to modern trends in social media, trying to follow those and, you know, to be diverse in how people can find you. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, the reason why I started YouTube, um, was to make my life easier actually as a reptile breeder into, so my goal is to be a good reptile breeder, an ethical reptile breeder where part of what I do is educate people on how to take care of the animals that I produce. I want people to be successful with the animals that I breed and then sell to them, right? They're not going to have a good experience. They're not going to have a positive memory of me if they don't do well with the the animal that I, I sold them. And plus, of course, I just want that animal to live a healthy life. So I started YouTube, um, so that I can make videos because that's how, you I know, mean, that's how I like to, you know, I like to learn visually. So I want people to be like, okay, Hey, how do I, I, I want to get a, a carpet chameleon, but how do I take care of it? Like, okay. Instead of me answering the same question a thousand times, here's a link to my YouTube video on how to take care of them. This is exactly what I do. And then I've always liked to write articles about reptiles. I, you know, I have a number published in like reptiles magazine and a few others now buy on and then, um, you know, just for myself, and I will publish those on my website so that people can, again, here's a link. You want to, you want to learn how to take care of a jewel deserta? Here's the link to the article that I wrote. Here's the link to my YouTube. Um, so I, having a website has been uh, crucial for me because I can link all of my resources in there. I've linked many of the podcasts that I've been on, you know, including many with you. Mm-hmm. They're linked right there on my website so people can have access to that good information. Um, link to my YouTube channel. And then plus also that's where I'm selling animals is directly through my website, right? It, have a, if you want to breed reptiles and, and sell them, get a website, right? Because, uh, you know, people are going to be much more likely to trust you and to see that you have at least a, a concrete digital storefront um, and go the digital route. You know, like it's reptile shows are all well and good, but you know, having being able to reach all 48 contiguous states you know that's a way bigger market than your local reptile shows that you can drive to even if you're driving six eight hours 
I still have a much bigger reach and much bigger market because I focus digitally mm -hmm. as opposed to locally at, at shows. So when you're in the mindset of, okay, I'm in, I'm now in the mindset to go reach. I want to reach people who don't know about uh, living art by Frank Payne. What do you, which tools, digital tools do you use? I mean, I, mostly Instagram um, at these days, you know, because like, again, it, you know, it, it's evolved over time, but definitely mostly Instagram at this point. Um, you know, I like to, because, you know, if you start working with a species, it, it takes a while, right, to, to raise them up, to breed them, to raise the babies, and maybe to hold them back and maybe not even sell until the second generation. That takes time. During that time, I like to prime people for what I will have available in the future. Check out Cophotus Dumbara. Check out the Knuckles Mountain Range Pygmy Lizard from Sri Lanka. You probably never heard, the, heard of this. Look how amazing it is. Let me show you how amazing it is. I love it. Let me tell you why you should love mm -hmm. it. You know, and just doing that, um, um, putting out, you know, like I made sure to like put out a jewel. Last year, I put out my Jewel Deserta Care video. I made sure to have that video out there before my uh my babies from last year became available so that was there as a resource for people and also just to get people um you know thinking about it but for me yeah, it is mostly instagram but i do try to spread it out you know i do like the different um uh classified um websites like say morph Mar market or fauna and then of course my own website so I just i try to to spread it out as much as possible so to, to hit as many people as i possibly can Okay, and you do send out an email newsletter uh, on a semi-regular mm -hmm. basis. What's your strategy yeah. behind that? Yep. Yeah. So, um, well, I, the animals that I produce, like say carpet chameleons, are a great example. Like I myself cannot produce enough to fill the demand of this species, and there aren't many other people breeding them. So, I one of the questions that I get asked the most is, "Do you have a wait list?" Um, and as a breeder, as a, don't do waitlists. You know, they're they're not a good thing to do from a breeder's perspective at all. Uh, but what I do tell people is like, okay, when I have animals available, I if you subscribe to my newsletter, you know, via my website, when I have animals available, I'm going to send out an email blast to all my subscribers saying, hey, I'm going to release a batch of carpet chameleons at 12 noon Eastern on Saturday the first. Right. So that way, you know, because again, like with carpet chameleons and with some of these other rare species, you know, that are in demand, like those things sell out like within minutes mm -hmm. and all people like get angry at me that they're not, you know, like, oh, you said you were gonna have carpet chameleons. I'm like, well, they were, they sold out within five minutes. I'm sorry. Like, I wish I had more. <laughs> Trust me. Like, I wish I could sell you more, but I, I mean, I'm just like, it's, it's literally me and my wife working out of a 400 square foot basement producing animals like we just we can't produce that that many um so that i do that through the website and i felt i found that to be very very helpful in organizing sales and bringing people to my website um so i, I definitely like that a lot where would you like to take this business well um for now we're pretty well maxed out i've you know, we've expanded and expanded and expanded for the past five years or so. Um, right now, we are we are maxed out, right? For the two of us, for the space that we have, I cannot take on anything else without letting something go. And as I establish more and more species that I really like and that I think have futures and that I want to keep breeding, you know, there's less and less stuff that I'm willing to let go. So it's, it's, we are at a point right now where we can't really expand so much. However, our plan is in within the next couple of years to put an addition on our home so that I am able to double the amount of space, go from 400 square feet to 800 square feet um, so that we can expand so that these species that are kind of bubbling up that are just starting to produce here or that I, you know, like say the, you know, the Dumbara or let's say knobtail geckos or mossy leaf tail geckos, you know, things like that, that are, are, I'm starting to breed, but I want to breed in larger numbers. Those can be expanded. 
There's a handful of other species that I think are have a good uh, potential as candidate species. So that way we'll have the ability to do that. So within a couple of years, hopefully that will happen. For now, my strategy um, is to simply reach more people. To I want more people to know about me, about the animals that we're producing. Um, I want you know, like everybody thinks of me right now for carpet chameleons. I want to make sure that everybody thinks of me for jeweled lacertas mm -hmm. or you know knuckles pygmy lizard in, in the future. So that's my goal for the next couple of years before we can expand is to simply expand our reach. Um, which means I need to get back on YouTube. I get, you know, messages all the time about make more videos. Man. Like I, I know it's like one of those things like I need to do it. It's good for the business. It's good for everybody. Cause I can get the information out there that people want. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a struggle for me. I'm a, I'm a reptile breeder. I'm not a, I am not a content creator. <laughs> um, I, I find inst I, I, I couldn't do what you do. Um, I find Instagram to be pretty easy. Um, you know, like all that, like I'm working with my animals, right? I'm feeding them. I'm cleaning them. Oh, this one's doing something cool. Oh, look how pretty this looks today. Video, 10 seconds, 20 seconds done. Mm -hmm. There's the video. I slap it up there. I attach a trending sound to it. I, you know, put, you know, tags and uh, topics in there and then it's done. Like it's literally, so like I take the video without even thinking just in the course of my day, I don't plan my Instagram videos, like, you know, like some people like that are true content creators, like they plan their reels out, their TikToks out, you know, elaborately like, Oh no, look, this, this here's a pretty lizard. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm lucky in that way because my face rarely appears on my Instagram. Um, it's, it's the animals, the animals are the showcase. And, um, but I do need to get my face out there more when it comes to YouTube, just so I can, you know, get those educational videos out there. I think that, you know, there is a need for that and that will also help the business. Now you're also a uh, teacher, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been a science teacher for 16 years. And how is, and let's not talk exact numbers, but magnitude wise, is this reptile breeding a, a, a significant addition to the household income? I mean, I, I, yeah, it, it's a lot, it's a lot more, Okay, it's a lot more than teaching. I make a lot more money breeding reptiles than I do teaching period. Um, I don't mind saying that, you know, I don't need to say numbers or anything like that, but like I've been a teacher for 16 years. I have a master's degree, right? I am on the higher pay scale when it comes to a teacher, right? I am not making beginner teaching salary. I'm making veteran teacher salary. And I make significantly more money breeding and selling reptiles than I do teaching. Um, teaching provides a lot of benefits like a pension, mm -hmm. like health insurance for my entire family at almost no cost to me. You know, plus I love teaching, you know, teaching is, is a wonderful profession and, um, you know, I'm very proud to be a teacher. Um, but my, my, my wife now works, <clears throat> excuse me, my wife works full time for the business for living art. Right. Um, and with the two of us, you know, I couldn't do all this by myself at this point. Right. There's, there's just oh, no yeah. way that one, I could do it. I could do it by myself if I wasn't yeah. a teacher, yeah. but being a teacher, there's literally, there's literally no way it would work. It, it came to a point where it's just like, okay, you know what? It actually makes more sense for you to stay home and, and take care of the animals while I'm teaching. Um, it was because, you know, like you're going to make, you're going to make a lot more money doing that than you are uh -huh. working for someone else. You know, like, you know, like she didn't have like, um, you know, she, we, we met right at, you know, while she was still in college and she graduated college and so forth. So it's like, it just made sense. We just, it worked out very well. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, if it, if it, if I didn't have a family to provide for, I would probably just do the reptile thing full time. Um, but, you know, when you're the head of a household, you have to take, um, you know, other people into consideration. And so it's just, you know, as I love teaching, I don't want to give the wrong impression, but it's, it's, it's a very, you know, having a full-time job is a very good safety net oh, yeah. because like the thing is, so like, I know that my bills are going to get paid no matter what, because I have my teaching salary come in. Do you, you know, there won't be anything left over <laughs> after those bills are paid. But at least the bills will be paid. Whereas if you're 
you know, if I were doing this, you know, full time, you know, doing nothing else, um, like there are months like where I don't make nearly as much as I do another month. And that's the, you know, the thing about, you know, I'm sure it's like common sense to most people, but like, you know, there's a month where I'll make 25% of what I made the previous month, but my bills are still the same. Like the amount of bills are still the same. Like some, the summer months for the pet industry is a major dip. Um, so there's a major reduction in sales across the entire pet industry uh, during the summer months because people are outside doing things, taking vacations, spending their money and their time elsewhere. The fall, the spring, and the winter is when people are spending more time at home, uh, focusing more on their pets and or like starting a new hobby or something like that. So like summer months, sales are down for everybody in the pet industry. And it's not just reptiles either. Um, and without that, um, secondary, um, job, then, you know, that could be a problem. Yeah. There's a little bit of a dose of reality there. Sometimes it's not about all, well, often it's not about just the numbers of uh, what's coming in. It's, uh, the benefits and the stability. That's a huge wow. thing to consider. Yeah. It is, it really is. And, you know, it's, and it's just the perfect career for me because I, um, love talking, you know, and educating about science. And I always have, but then at the same thing, you know, like I have summers off, I have, you know, long breaks in the winter and the fall where I can be home with my family, with my animals. Like summers are great because it's our busy season. Everything is hatching right now. <laughs> like we are up to our shoulders in baby lizards right now, right? The spring egg boom is now the summer baby boom. And if I wasn't home, Oh my gosh, my poor wife, you know, like we'd be, we would be working literally all day. Mm -hmm. Like she would work all day when I would be at work. And then if I had to come home then like a typical nine to five, then I would work from then on. Um, so like it, it's, it's, it's just a very good balance. It just works out super well for our situation, you know? And if we're talking like dose of reality, like when it comes to breeding animals or taking anything that's animal base like when i was a zookeeper we we you know took turns coming in on christmas or coming in on fourth of july because animals need to eat animals need clean water animals need their waste cleaned up every single day of the year fourth of july part of my day i had enclosures in the backyard and i was soaping them and scrubbing them mm -hmm. and i was doing that you know on my holiday like we are now at a point where we can take more vacations, financially speaking, but we can't take like vacations mm -hmm. because we can't leave the animals. Yeah. Like we, we have a three day maximum. Like we'd love to go like her family has a beach house. You know, it's only a three hour drive away. Um, but like we can't go more than, or at least both of us can't go for more than two nights, three days because I have a lot of automation built into what I'm doing here automatic misting, automatic lighting, automatic temperature control, redundancies and all that. But like animals need to eat, you know, especially baby animals, animals need to be cleaned. Like you can't just go, like I used to travel a lot when I had small collections. I, I just don't anymore because I can't because I have hundreds of animals, you know, to take care of. So it's just like, if you are a business owner, like you are a business owner 365 days a year. And that's that. <laughs> that's and but you know what? It's worth it. It's totally worth it. But it, that's a fact of life, though. Yeah, I, I will say, being a with the chameleons that I have, I, there's no vacations. But then again, if I were given time off, this is exactly where I'd want to be. So it's exactly, exactly. So uh, to close this off. We, we've touched on so much. I, I don't know what else anybody would need to know, but uh, is there anything else you'd like to close off with to people who are thinking about getting into breeding? Sure. Um, so I'll just kind of reiterate a little bit about what I've said previously. Um, it's just before you get into breeding, just make sure that you have, you have already established experience keeping a collection of animals before attempting to breed um so th that that's build your experience because that for me to be a successful reptile breeder you have to have animal husbandry experience 
you cannot, this is not something that you can just follow a simple recipe, right? It's an art and a science. Like it's both of those things. And if you don't have the animal husbandry experience, you are going to have problems, major problems that you're probably not going to be able to come out of, you know, whole. So I think that that needs to come first before jumping into it as a breeder business. If you have the experience already and it's still something that's appealing to you, then yeah, absolutely go for it. But again, my opinion, don't start with the simplest or in maybe the, the most common species like, you know, leopard geckos or whatever. Like everybody recommends those things um, for breeding for their first time, but like there's just so many of them. Um, try to find some way to distinguish yourself because that's important in every business marketplace and as the reptile industry becomes bigger and bigger and bigger as it has been every single year and as there is more and more breeders competition is becoming greater and if you want to do this you need to have some sort of way uh, to distinguish yourself otherwise you know you're gonna have a hard time making the business successful Frank, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing your experiences in being a breeder. This, this is wonderful. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody. You heard it. And so uh, you've got a lot to chew on. Thank you very much, Frank. We'll see you later. Bye. See ya. All right. It's review time. Excellent interview. And I love that Frank brought out that most of the successful breeders that we see out there didn't start off with the idea that they were going to have a breeding business. They were hobbyists. They just got so good at what they do that a business became natural. And then they just had to make a decision. Do they stop being as good as they are at what they do? Or do they open a business so they can uh, sell the babies and get them to new homes? And it's worth acknowledging that although reptile breeding is a pretty good return on space used, it is a difficult business. Once you become a reptile breeder, your vacations have pretty much evaporated until you're big enough to have a staff to work for you. And with reptile breeding, it's not inventory that sits on a shelf. It needs daily maintenance and daily care. And so I know being a reptile breeder is like a dream. And believe me, I get it. <laughs> really, when I said that, uh, it, yeah, I may not be able to go on vacation, but I don't want to leave this. This is my own personal Jurassic Park. Where would I go that's better than this? And there's a lot of truth to that. But I do encourage you to listen to these interviews that I have with breeders. And so you make sure that you're ready for that kind of lifestyle. Frank, I want to thank you very much for coming on and sharing your experiences with all of us. And to all of you, I thank you for joining me on this very fun journey of exploring entrepreneurship in the reptile community. And as a closing, I encourage you to follow Frank on Instagram, Facebook, and get his newsletter and watch what he does. Watch how he starts the marketing for a species that you may not have heard before. Well, there's a lot that we can learn in watching how Frank does things. I know I personally have enjoyed watching his business grow, and I've learned about new species along the way. And with that, this is Bill Strand signing off, and I'll see you next time.